Good evening, everyone. I am so excited to be back. Uh, I was, uh, we were live two days ago and we're live again because we just cannot stop talking to incredible authors, uh, nor do we want to stop talking to incredible authors. So I'm really excited that this is how I'm going to be spending um, my Monday evening, and I hope that you're excited as well. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Director of Operations for The Novel Neighbor. If you're not familiar with us, we are an independently owned and operated bookstore that can be found in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, if you do not live close to St. Louis, or um, even if you do, but you don't want to come into the store, I just want to note up front that we can ship you books, we can do curbside pickup. So um, if you have not picked up a copy of tonight's book that we're talking about, please know that that is an option. And I will throw up a banner here in a second that tells you where you can purchase that book from. Um, and that book is, of course, African Icons. I could not be more excited to talk about this book. Um, I have been looking forward to this book for literally, I think, since March. And I'll um, tell Tracy why in a second. I didn't tell her this when we were in the green room um, just a few minutes ago. Um, so we'll talk about all of that. But first, I want to introduce our incredible author. Um, we are going to be talking to Tracy Beth Batiste. Um, she lived in Trinidad until she was 15. She grew up on Jumbie's stories and fairy tales and is the author of the Jumbie series, which I know we are all huge fans of. We sell out of that at the bookstore all the time. Um, in addition to being a New York Times bestselling author, Author of Minecraft the crash who doesn't need a Minecraft book in their life uh, that's how I understand what some of um, my friends kids are talking to me about um, she is a, also a former teacher who works as a writer and editor and you can visit her online at tracybatiste.com so without any further ado Tracy hello I'm so Hi, happy hello. That you're here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me okay so now you're gonna have to tell me like why you were so excited about the book um, yes. No, I um, couldn't even believe I forgot to say this. Um, well, I didn't forget. I wanted to surprise you, but it's not that <laughs> exciting. But I think it's really exciting. I've been waiting for this for a long time um, because I think it was back in March. Um, Algonquin and someone else, a couple different imprints, publishers, now I'm blanking all the things, held like a dinner for booksellers. But it was like virtual, right? Because yeah, we can't be I remember that. Yes. And you were one of their featured authors. And I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait. I know I went into our like system that we um, kind of make notes on like books that we're excited about, especially before we do like our front list order, which for people who are like, you're throwing a lot of words out here, is our way of like picking out books that we're ordering for like the next season. So looking at like what we were going to order um, in preparation for the fall. And I remember putting in like, this book looks incredible. It's going to have incredible artwork. Tracy's amazing. Like I cannot wait to hand sell that. <laughs> Um, so when, and then we received an advanced copy of it, which was awesome, but the advanced copy is not in full color. So every step of the way, I've been like excited for like a new unveiling where I got to be like, <laughs> okay, here's the 10 people that were chosen slash like all of the extra things that are in it. Here's the content of the book. And then when this copy arrived, I literally like almost died. Like <laughs> I was just like on the ground where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm known for being a little bit dramatic about books. Like even our UPS <laughs> delivery guide knows this. Like if we see a title on the outside, I'm like, oh my gosh, that one's finally here. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have been so looking forward to talking with you about this. Um, oh, I'm so glad. Thank you so much. I am. And people are probably like, Stephanie, stop talking so that we can hear from Tracy. We know <laughs> you're obsessed with the book. Um, and that's fair. That's a fair criticism. I want to point out, first of all, that Anne is already admiring the amazing Legos in your background. <gasps> are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to tilt my screen a little bit so you can see a little better. So I, I, so I have all of these buildings, right? Um, and then down here, and I have some more. I've, that's Sesame Street up there at the top there. That's Sesame Street. And um, sort of, I have to move Tip. Tip is my plant. I move Tip, and you see that typewriter? And that typewriter is actually made of Legos as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a Lego fan. I love that. Yeah, so it's like it's like the thing that I do to like sort of wind down. It's like I build a new thing, um, and I usually I do a lot of like all of these are sets, but sometimes I build things for myself. Like Lego doesn't have like an official library, so I've been building a library for myself, and so I bought all of these like really little books, and I've been like 
like, you know, like I take the cover of a book and I like reduce the size of it so I can put it on the front so it looks like the actual books of my friends. <laughs> It's definitive. You're the coolest person I know. Like, I'm, it's done. It's over. Like, that is... It's, it's quite a project. It's taking a really long time. <laughs> I would imagine that you'll be working on this for a while. Yeah. Um, probably forever. I just probably did, like, one of those things that will never finish building. Because I keep, like, breaking it apart and doing it over like I have better ideas. Like, I'm not, like, a natural Lego builder. And, okay. I, I, and I, I'm one of those people who, like, I like to work without a plan which is not wise. <laughs> it's just, so like I break things about, I'm like, ooh, it would have been better if I had done this instead of I break it apart and I start all over again. That is so funny. <laughs> um, except for I'm sure it's not funny at the time when you're breaking it apart and starting all over, but it's all about the process, right? It yeah, but it's, it's very, for me, it's like very much like writing. Like you write something and then it's like, it's working, it's not working. And you break some parts of it apart and you start all over again with those parts. So it feels a lot the same for me. And I'm also a knitter and I like, I do that. Like, I'll like say, I'm going to make a sweater and I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'll just start. And then I'll be like, oh, you know, I think I should have made this like longer in the torso. So I would like rip it back a few, like a whole bunch and then like start all over. It's just like, okay, I'll just make this part longer. So like, I, yeah, I just, I don't like following yeah. instructions or rules. Or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's probably really relatable to some of our friends who are watching. <laughs> this is kind of really hitting them. Uh, they feel very seen. But okay, they, good. I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> It's like terrible no, like that. That's incredible. Do you have a set that you're working on other than the library? Um, I actually do. Actually, I can show you. Hold on. <laughs> you all thought we were coming to talk about book content and it quickly changed the time. <laughs> I'm making a tree house. So this is where I am on the tree house right now. I see the little birdie and the bird's nest, the bird tree house. And then of course there's a swing. There's a guy on the swing. So this is actually the one I'm like mid. This one is an actual set. Okay. Um, so I'm doing this, you know, taking a break from the library and building like an actual set with instructions. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. You were amazing. I am so obsessed with this. Um, <laughs> this is, I'm sure, why your students loved you. Like it just like bodes well that like there's no way that you wouldn't have connected with students if you're like. Oh, we used to have a ball when I was a when I was a classroom teacher. It was a lot of fun. Um, one of my and again, it like it, you know, it's sort of like good classroom teacher, bad classroom teacher. But I was that person who didn't want to follow the um, the textbook. You know, yeah. like I would sort of extrapolate from the textbook and say, oh, you guys are really interested in this sort of this little thing. Well, let me do a whole bunch of research and let's just go down, you know, a rabbit hole together and find out stuff. And then I'm like way off the textbook. Right. right. So, you know, but the kids were like a lot more engaged. Uh, you know, it's a lot more work for me. But, you know, those are the kinds of things that I like to do. It's just like, oh, this is really interesting. You guys interested in that? Let's find out. Let's like see what that's about. You know, and that so that's what the, that was the kind of teacher that I that I was, which, you know, is good and bad. <laughs> cool measure. I have a feeling that's going to come up tonight as we're talking about, well, and I'm sure you did do so much research and I want to ask you about your research process for African icons, but I am sure that we will go down some rabbit holes tonight. Um, as you were saying <laughs> of just things that we didn't know, which is reminding me, um, everyone watching, please feel free at any point in time to throw questions, comments in um, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Um, we will definitely be looking at them throughout the entirety of the event. So please feel free to um, jump in if there's something that I'm not asking enough about or something that sparked a question for you. We definitely want to hear it as it's coming. Um, and, and I love to be interrupted. So, you know, like, feel free. <laughs> like, it doesn't bother me at all. We can, we can switch paths very easily, very yeah. quickly. Um, okay. So... Well, and one thing that I should read the full title of the book of, I keep referring to it as African Icons. Technically, it's African Icons, 10 People Who Shaped History. And before we get into who those 10 people are that are covered and some of the other content information that's covered inside of it, um, can you just tell us a little bit of, I mean, I could talk to people about it, but I don't think that I'm the one people want to hear from. So, Tracy, can you tell us, like, more about this book, um, what it is and maybe how it came to be, if that like kind of fits into talking about it as I imagine it might. Sure, yeah, so um, this actually started, uh, it was kind of a fluke how this whole thing started. Um, there was one um, 
it was February 1st, so it was the beginning of Black, uh, Black History Month, and there were a bunch of teachers who were writing blog posts about, like giving, te giving educators um, information that they can give to their classrooms um, or their students about um, Black history. And uh, so it was a lot of, you know, writers like me who were former educators as well, who were doing these blog posts. And, you know, I was reading them all day and I hadn't planned really to participate because it's not like everybody was doing it. And then somewhere towards, um, you know, near the end of the day or like, you know, mid afternoon, somewhere around there, um, I realized that all of the posts were either about people who had been enslaved, um, freed slaves, um, the civil rights movement, um, uh, the civil war, reconstruction, it was all post-slavery um, icons. And like all of the people who you hear about all the time, over and over and over again. And that has always kind of bugged me because the fact is African history starts way before people were enslaved and brought into the Americas. So I very quickly did like some Google searching because, you know, like I don't, you know, have facts off the top of my head at all. And I found like maybe six or seven things about African peoples before slavery. So before like the 1500s. And I just did a blog post called Africans Before Slavery and I put it up and a lot of people really responded to it. And my editor saw it and she asked me if I would like to um, make a book out of it. And I thought, oh, how hard could that be? <laughs> sure, <laughs> I'm not a researcher. That sounds like something I could do. <laughs> yeah, so four years later, <laughs> couple of years of research later, um, you know, like we're we're like just you know get it like uh, getting out of from the hole that I dug for myself because yeah I really didn't know um, I didn't know what I didn't know which is a lot <laughs> and then I'm not I, I'm not a researcher so I didn't even know how to start particularly so what I did was I I basically just called up librarian librarians that I knew and um, educators that I knew, and I was just like, what do I do? How do I do it? Where should I start? Where should I go? What should I read? Um, and people were super forthcoming with information. People were really great about, they're like, oh, you should go to this um, museum, or you should go to this library, or um, here's a person you should talk to, and here's their email address. <laughs> and, you know, and that's kind of how um, the whole thing came about. And when I started doing it, so what you see here, like, it, the idea was not really at least the first idea was not really to have 10 icons that I went to. It wasn't like that. I didn't start with icons. So, so you can imagine, I'm sure that the title changed several times <laughs> in the process. Um, but when I handed in the very first draft, the thing that I did was I identified a bunch of things that had happened in African history and I put them in chronological order. And the thing that I was noticing was there were a lot of rise and falls of empires um, and kingdoms um, in, in Africa. So a lot of them started in, in uh, Eastern Africa, um, you know, like the first start of um, kingdoms and empires started there. Then there were a lot in Northern. There were, you know, a whole bunch of rise and fall happening in Western Africa and South Africa and, and so on. And so the first draft was not really about people. It was about these things that were happening. And in the draft that I handed in, there were 11 people that I mentioned. And my editor came back and said, why don't we make it about the people? And then she chose the 10th. The 11th person was Prince Alimeyu, who is, um, was an Ethiopian prince. And the reason that he wasn't, the reason he, you know, hit the, the chopping block was because he was actually only two years old during the events that, that surrounded him and, and all of the, you know, things that happened there. So he was really too little to have understood what was going on or have done anything. So, you know, he didn't really participate. Um, and then he was immediately moved to um, the United Kingdom. So he didn't really spend a lot of time in Ethiopia anyway. 
and also because it was past the point that we really wanted to talk about. So that was not a pre-enslavement um, moment in time. So that was already in the, I want to say the 1700s or the 1800s already. Um, so it was, you know, it was just too late um, for the rest of them and too far removed from the rest of them. But all of the rest of them, this was all before Europeans came into Africa and started taking up, um, started uh, colonizing basically a whole bunch of various countries. So we stuck with those first 10. So I had to go back in and do re-research so that I could really tell their stories, um, you know, which... <laughs> Which are great and not nice. <laughs> <laughs> You're really great, a lot. Just like the sweater. Let me pull all these threads back. And That's right. That's yeah. exactly. That is exactly the whole thing, right? Let me rip out this whole sweater. I mean, like you know, the bottom border works. So let me rip this sweater back and start from that border. Do 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 do. Yeah. Well, that actually answered one of my other questions that I had for you, because I was wondering how in the world you narrow it down to 10 people, because I'm sure there is so much content. There's there, so yeah, much there, there are so, so, so many more people. But as I was trying to look at the big events that had happened in African history, you know, from prehistory until about the 1500s, well, I mean, that's a huge swath of time. But these 10 people sort of rose to the top as people who, A, had already gotten a lot of attention from other historians, um, had enough information about them that I could write an entire story about them. Because there were other people who, um, for example, Ahmed Baba is somebody who I really would have liked to write more about, but you know, there, there wasn't enough time and there wasn't enough information. And who, who founded um, 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 able to find information about her, but you know, she is somebody who I would have to have heard about. So there's plenty of Sorry. <laughs> I think your internet, something happened where the internet went wonky. Oh, no. Yes, Patricia, Tracy's frozen, but she's back. She's back. We got her. Oh, I'm back. Okay. So what, what did I miss? What did you miss? <laughs> um, so we need you to recap. We basically heard you say up to you. What it, what was the first thing? You, oh, when I was talking about Ahmed Baba. Yes. And literally yeah, like, after that. So basically everything you said. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought maybe it was supposed to be. And we were going to keep powering through, but Patricia was like, hey, she's frozen. I was like, OK, it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's fine. Um, yeah, so Ahmed Baba was this librarian in Timbuktu who um, was just somebody who wrote a lot of fatwas. And fatwas are these uh, legal opinions. And so people would go to him um, for his legal opinions. And so he just, you know, he was just one of those people who was just like really fascinating. He knew a lot. He was very um uh very well respected and and so on but i just wasn't able to find out enough information about him at the time i think that there's more information about him now that i could like go back and, and get information on him and there was also um the woman who founded mombasa who is uh moana mkisi yeah i mentioned it at the end yeah 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 so um yeah there were f a few people who you know, really stood out to me, but I wasn't able to get all of them in. So, you know, we stuck with these 10 people because that's what I was able to get information on. Yeah, that makes that makes a ton of sense. Um, I have probably <laughs> an impossible question to answer, but because sure. um, all of these 10 people are icons, obviously, they were chosen for a reason. They all have incredible stories. Um, did any of them like particularly like cement themselves into your life? Like, is there any one of them that you can give like a particular like 
shout out to or like talk about a little bit? Yeah, well? yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. So, um, Kanake Amanarenas, I think, is somebody who I really. That's yeah. literally who I Oh, like. you got it. But that's who I put for that I was going to be like, she really stuck with me. <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry. I mean, the whole thing is, I had never heard of her before. Yeah. Right? So to find out, because the thing is, like, we all have heard about Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We've all heard about Caesar, and most of us know the story about how Cleopatra met her end. Um, right. So you know the whole thing with with her, and then you know, like she she apparently she then tried to smuggle her children out of Egypt, and was trying to send them down to Ethiopia. What I didn't, what we didn't know, is that Kanake Amanarenas would have been a contemporary of hers, which means, of course, that she lived at the same time. And so the Caesar that Kandake Amanorenas goes toe to toe with is the same Caesar that Cleopatra had to deal with. So after Caesar conquered Egypt and Egypt became Roman Egypt, then Caesar set his sights further south looking towards Kush. Kush was just below Egypt and the Kushites and the Egyptians had basically the same culture. They had the same gods, they had the same pyramids, they had the same customs, the whole nine yards, but they were a completely different country. And um, so Caesar decided that he was going to, you know, they had conquered Egypt, they were gonna conquer Kush next, but Kanake and Monarenus and her husband were like, no, you won't. And they attacked um, Roman Egypt first. And so there were years where the two of them were in conflict and eventually, Amanarenas was able to, Rome actually pushed their way into Kush and Kanake, the Kanake was able to push them back out of Kush. And she sent a delegation of diplomats to Rome to negotiate with Caesar to maintain um, the open trade routes that they already had um, to maintain diplomacy between their two countries and to keep her lands exactly as they were before the Romans started coming in. So the, the, to know that there was somebody who was able to do that at the same time was, why did I not ever hear about her? Like it was, it was so infuriating to me. Well, and especially because like what really stuck out to me when I was reading through them and why I think I really latched onto her was because I didn't realize that there were marriages to even look at where they were equal partners, basically. Like you make a point of pointing out that like from at least everything that we can tell, like her and her husband had pretty much like equal power, if I'm yeah, saying. They did, yeah. You know? um, and then I really loved that like there's a whole um, part of in that the Caesar story where like they kept his little statue head, right? Yes. <laughs> and they put it underneath the ground so that people were walking on Caesar's head. Like Caesar, and this is just like some petty like stuff of like, I love A, that we know that small factoid because that tells me someone cared a lot to keep that included in history. And I am like <laughs> here for that. Like if that can make it through to here, like perfect. I I relate to that person so hard. <laughs> Yes, and it's petty. Like, it was so petty. petty. It was like, but petty in like the best way, right? Yes. In the best way, like it's. So <laughs> uh, I just I love insulting Caesar. Who? Sorry, it's a good pastime. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's so funny. Um, and I that's I love that that's who you talked about because I was like, if we don't talk about her, like we have to talk about her at some point. This evening. <laughs> yeah, because she was just yeah, amazing. She's great. She, She's yeah, the one who yeah. cover for people who are wondering. Yeah, yeah. There's incredible photos of her. Um, <laughs> I also want to take a second to I point out just her photo. And as you've been talking, I really, oh, of course, it's going to now. It's going to take me a second to find it. Oh, well, it was really helpful. You give this amazing map, too, yeah. kind of to what you're speaking to of, like, where everyone, sorry, everyone, this is backwards from what I'm, I'm not used to 
having to do things in reverse. <laughs> I know it's so awkward, but yeah, the, 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 the great thing about the map is that it basically shows you where everybody was in, in space, but also will tell you the time period. So like, if you look at the little map key, it'll tell you exactly when, um, you know, like they existed and, you know, like we had other things, like we were like, you know, when were the first poisons developed? When were the first bows and arrows developed? Um, how many libraries were there? And we didn't actually even put in all the libraries. Um, there were many more libraries, but I, I just put in sort of the, the like really big ones. Um, like everybody's still, you know, crying over the library of Alexandria that burned down. But the fact is like, everybody talked about the library of Alexandria, like it was the only one, but there were like 10 others. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and, and the thing is, it's like, the scribes would go from one library to the other one and like sit there and they'd like live there for months or whatever it was, carefully copying the manuscripts that were there and then taking them back to their own libraries. So it was not like the story that I had learned was that, you know, this library burned down. It was the only one that was like it. We lost everything. And we lost everything, but that's actually not true. You know, there were there were other libraries. I mean, yes, it was a loss for sure. I'm sure there were things that were lost that are not recoverable, but there were plenty of other libraries and there were probably copies of a lot of those things that were at uh, Alexandria in other libraries around um, Africa, especially in North and West Africa. Well, so this is really bringing up something for me that also kind of connects to what we were talking to a little bit before we went live. And that's like, <laughs> For at least a lot of people, we feel like you go through a phase as a kid of being very into Egypt and like Egypt geographic area adjacent things. I believe I said like once I felt like I had really gone down the rabbit hole of Egypt, I started to expand past it because I like ran out of content. Right. And, um, <laughs> needed more. And so I just kept learning about, um, you know, a lot of North Africa region. Um and so I just find it so interesting going back to kind of how you had to start this in the first place that like somewhere along the line, if we all go through or many of us go through this phase of being really interested in this, like where do we become so disconnected from attaching this to history in the United States? Um, if that train of thought makes any sense. I just think. Um, I mean, I, I think that I think that what happens or at least, you know, you know, what I feel is that there is something of a disconnect with what Egypt was or what ancient Egypt was um, that sort of set it apart in in the minds of people mm. um, from the rest of the African continent. So if you look, for example, like, you know, I went to the Met, um, I was very, you know, lucky to be able to have had sort of a, you know, backstage tour of the Met with one of the curators. And why, it, you know, like it's, it seemed very strange to me that Egypt is on literally one side of the Met and the art of Africa and um, uh, Oceanic, I can't remember what the word is exactly, um, are literally on the other side, like all the way on the other side of the Met. They are nowhere close to each other. So they, it, it makes it feel like they have no relation to each other whatsoever when in fact, it was an African nation, number yeah. one. The people were African, <laughs> were two. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of um, intermingling between people who were, you know, like right across the Red Sea um, from the Middle East and, and fr from, um, so the Phoenicians and from the Italians and, and so, so there was a lot of intermingling because there was a lot of trade between all of it, but it didn't just happen only in Egypt. Like that was, that was really, you know, expanded <laughs> beyond Egypt and Egypt was very much connected to the rest of the continent. Like a lot of, um, for, so for example, um, Egypt didn't really have a lot of treats. So how are they building all of their buildings? Well, they got all of their trees really from um, lands to the south. So Kush in Ethiopia provided the lumber 
for Egypt to be able to construct buildings and to be able to have like scaffolds on pyramids so that they could make them. And the boats that they were using and, and all of that, those came from other places. They all had these relationships. And at some point in the historical consciousness, I'm, I'm just gonna say it like that because I don't know how else to phrase it. That's a good phrasing of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Egypt became this separate entity um, that was separate from Africa. So I actually had um, just this week, actually, like a troll sort of reach out to me on Twitter to tell me that I'm blackwashing history because Egyptians were not black people. And I'm like, were they African? Like, did you, first of all, did you read the book? You couldn't have possibly because I don't know what you're doing, but were they African? <laughs> like, you know, where were they from? Where did they live? <laughs> where are they from? <laughs> like, you know, like, but that seems to be news to people. It really seems to be news to people that Egyptians are African. Which is why I would <laughs> love to take this moment to tell everyone African Icons, while you might find it in the children's nonfiction history section of our bookstore, is very much a book that everyone should read and get so, like, there's so much to get out of this. I am. Um, as an adult, um, that it's unreal. Like there's just in, I think it's really important for people to hear that because I am constant. I literally, I went through a thing where I was looking for like, we actually get requests where people are like, I want information on Egypt, but I, I want it to be fine. Like I want to explore that more. I am, um, and this is the perfect book for that. <laughs> right. You get to go down these incredible stories. Um, I also want to take the time to point out, so like there's 10 people featured, but there's a lot of sections. Um, and I don't know how you all decide. And I imagine that some of this is like part of what was in maybe your first manuscript that you were telling us yeah. about. Of like, there's a lot of like, not like side tangents, but kind of, of like, as it fits in with people's stories, like here's something about like the dawn of Egypt. Here's like where few people went, like where few dared to tread um, and culture loss. Like there's so many little sections that you get that go along with these stories that give you even more context and history that you're missing. Um, Am I correct in assuming that those were part of the original manuscript and like- Yeah, a lot of those were part of the original manuscript. And then what happened is that, you know, like that sort of receded a little bit so that the the stories of people could um, come forward a little bit. But the thing is, you kind of have to understand the context, right? Like you can't really understand why it is, um, you know, Egypt becoming such a big deal is a big deal unless you understand how it came to be formed like it you know like so in so exactly as you say like in the dawn of egypt i start talking about how the sahara was expanding and what happened was it pushed all of these um various cultures out from from the sahara itself and so that they were forming literally all the way around the sahara and egypt was one of those and you have to also understand that the Sahara protected Egypt um, from its Western border. And then there was the sea on its Eastern border. Um, and then, you know, so they were in a really prime position to be able to develop in the way that they did. And because it was a very short trip across the water to, um, to the Middle East or up into Europe, there was a lot of, you know, exchange of culture because of that. Because Kush was a little bit just below it, they had a lot of the same things, but they didn't have as much interaction as the Egyptians did. So, so like those kinds of things are really important to be able to know, like if you really want to understand it. I mean, the fact is you could go through and just read the stories about each of the 10, um, you know, like you could read just the stories about each of the 10 icons and not read any of those interstitials. But if you really want to understand how it happened and why it happened, it, it kind of makes a big difference. Like with um, Tin Hinan, for example, the way that um, the timing of her finding the city in the Sahara was just as the trade routes, the, the, tr um, the sub-Saharan trade routes were starting to blossom. Um, and so her finding a city inside of the dunes where travelers and tradespeople and so on could come through and stop and get water and supplies and, and whatnot 
made a huge difference for that, for that to be able to happen. So, you know, like all of those things kind of work together. Like nobody sort of comes into their own without the context of, well, this is what was happening around them. This is what was happening in the land. This is when people started finding iron and what happened with that. This is when people started finding gold and what happened with that. Um, you know, and this is why this person was important at this time in this particular place. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because as we know, like that can really, all of those things can also change like what's happening. I would, I was sighing because I was like, I know I'm going to think of like a great example of this later, but that's like what I was sitting there thinking about. Like we also know how important context is, how much like elements that are outside of a civilization's control can like help turn the tide on something very quickly, like outside of the geopolitical culture necessarily. Um, So it's just all of these, and I think what's so impressive about everything that put together, and I hope that you feel that it's worth it after four years and thinking it was worth it. Research would be, it's like it's so co it's like this beautiful cohesive package that is so easy to follow. It's so rich with content um, that it. I mean, it's just like I would argue it's one of the most perfect books. But Aww. so I hope that you feel. I hope you're like okay after these four years, I can finally rest. I can take it yeah. I mean, I'll rest after the tour is over. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll you're sort of like, you have to beds for this. What are you talking about? Um, I <laughs> do want to make sure that we talk about, um, and I'm not sure how much you got to have a role in this, um, but I definitely think we want to know, like, it's a beautifully designed book. Um, and so some key things that I know I attached to is like, first of all, if you take off the cover of it, all of these are representative of a border like each kind of chapter person gets a different border. They're all on, this is like a quick way to show you all the different ones yeah. that I flip through. Um, and I know that AU worked with an amazing um, illustrator, but then it also sounds like there was an amazing book designer and that this was all a great cohesive package of how were you going to put this together? Because these aren't just random um, symbols. No, yeah, they're not. They're, uh, they, they have actual meaning. Um, yeah, so uh, the designer, uh, her name is Sarah Jonas, and so she actually has a designer's note uh, at the very end of the book that you can read. And the thing about the symbolism that she used is that not only is it connected to a particular character, um, you know, like particularly one of the icons, but also, so like you can see the icons have their own like little, you know, thing here, but also those symbols are not, they're also not random. Like they're thoughtful as far as who these people were and what their culture was. So, so their um, African um, culture uses a lot of symbols in their um, their design patterns. Like it, they're very highly artistic. Um, one of the sections talks about the um, the gold weights that they used when they were going across the Sahara. Let me see if I can find one of those is probably an Across the Golden Sand, which is page 92. Um, so the gold weight that they were using to like weigh, you know, whatever that they, they were selling, oh, when, yeah. the, um, when the people from, um, you know, so it, it came actually from the Middle East. And so they would have just like, okay, so here it is. Um, so this one looks like a turtle. Um, and it's uh, you know made out of copper and it's very beautiful. But it was it was a specifically it was specifically used as a particular weight that you can like use to measure like your salt that you were you know selling or or whatever it was. The ones that came from the Middle East were just you know squares or rectangles or whatever. They were just weights. Um, and the Africans they all like designed theirs and made them really beautiful. But the designs they were all very highly patterned. And each culture had, you know, specific types of patterns that they would use, and they would, and, and at different time periods, like they developed other patterns. And so Sarah uh, really looked at all of that to try to, you know, decide who would get what kind of pattern because it it kind of went with their culture. Um, so she was extremely thoughtful about how she did, 
you know, the designs that are inside of the book. They're very, very particular. They're not just, they're not just for pretty, you know, <laughs> like they actually mean something. Um, I, I'm like, I, I know that there's a plan at some point for, um, for Sarah, Hillary, and I to talk together, which I think will be really fascinating. Like, it'll be fascinating for me, for sure, to, like, learn about, you know, more about how they did their research. Um, but then we had a lot of meetings. There were a lot of meetings to talk about what the book would look like, what the interiors would look like. There were a lot of meetings about all of the maps that are in there, um, you know, the designing of the pages and so on. And Hillary would um, always ask me a lot of questions about the time period of the people, the kind of clothing they would have worn, um, the kind of jewelry they might have worn. Um, if you look at the Tin Hinan image, um, you know, that was very specific to the kind of jewelry that Tin Hinan would have worn. So it's on page 86. Let me see, where am I? Um, you know, and the, the kind of clothing that she would have worn. Um, but even like the Amon Arenas one, right? Yeah, like, you know, they're very, they, I mean, look at them side by side. They obviously are not from the same culture based on the clothing that they're wearing, but also notice that their faces are really quite different. And so the, the facial features of a person are called their phenotype. Um, and so Hillary really looked at the phenotypes for the time period and the location. So that, and the phenotype is like the shape of your face, um, the size of your eyes, the shape of your eyes, the shape of your nose, um, the shape of your mouth, that sort of thing. And those are really quite different depending on where, you know, like what traits you've picked up from, you know, wherever in the world that you are and what time period, because of course, with people traveling and intermingling and so on, you know, phenotypes will change over time. But she was very, very careful to make sure that the images that she show um, for each person matches what people would have looked like in that time period at that, um, um, in that space that they were. So it was a huge amount of research for the designer and for the illustrator as well. Well, and I think a lot of people don't know that on, often in publishing, or maybe they might know, but I, I often talk to customers who don't know that um, in publishing, often an illustrator and an author don't work directly together. Like each component is done completely separate. I imagined that that was not the case here, but it's so interesting to hear a little bit about the conversations that the three of you were having, including the designer in that, because um, and it clearly pays off. Like I think right. that really adds to like why this book is so significant, so special, like what really feels like it, it sets itself apart from a lot of other um, history texts, um, aside from the fact that it, I, it covers an area that desperately needs more information to be covered as we were talking about um, in the origins of this book. But um, that's just very cool that you all were part of that process. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, still- this was yes. the first time you saw like one of Hillary's like full. I'm sure the, it was just, the first, the first one, one I saw was Tintin and I. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's so. And did you just like did your jaw just drop? I was. I, was cool. I mean, I it, was just, just, it was just amazing. Oh, yeah. I think my audio went weird. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, okay? No, it's okay. It's fine now. I think it's okay now. Um. No, that is. I mean. And that's exactly how I think the reader, and that's why like the first time I opened it and I was very excited to see it in color um, is just like, you knew it was going to be amazing. You knew it was going to be breathtaking and it really, it really pays off. Um, it's incredibly engaging. Like you said, I mean, we held up some of the maps earlier, but there's also some great, I mean, I always love the illustration of like how much we forget the size of Africa because- right. Yeah, that one is like, yeah, that that's like a really big deal for me too, to like understand that what we look at every single day on a flat map is a distorted view of the planet really, because you cannot make a round planet flat. <laughs> like it just doesn't really, you have to sort of like shift things around. And what we look at is called the Mercator projection. And the Mercator projection has shrunk the size of Africa, but has 
increase the size of places like Greenland and the United States and Russia. Um, so what this particular designer did, his name is Kai, uh, Kai Krause, and he basically took a bunch of um, countries um, and put them in actual sort of ratio size to Africa and put, stuff them all inside so that he could see how many um, countries would actually fit inside of Africa. And you can see that the United States basically fits inside the Sahara. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There it is, that purple blob right there is the United States. It fits inside the Sahara. Actually, I think the Sahara is probably bigger. Than yeah, <laughs> I think so. bigger. yeah, I think it is bigger. <laughs> what is happening? I, think I, I know, it's crazy. It's crazy when you look at it like that. It's amazing. Well, and why I wanted to bring this up is because one of the questions um, that we received from our educators when we were talking about this, um, and we were actually, we had been out at, um, we are back to being able to do some in-person book fairs at our local schools. And your book was a huge hit um, at one at one that we did recently. And I was talking with the educators and they were wondering um, as an educator yourself, or well, previous educator yourself, <laughs> yourself um, do you, is there any way in particular that you would love to see this book used in classrooms or were there things that came to mind as you're putting it together of how you would love to see it incorporated into curriculums? I mean, I think it's one of those things. So I actually was at, at one point in my life, a curriculum designer. <laughs> like that was a thing that I did. That's amazing since you seem to not like curriculum. <laughs> no, it was crazy. Like I literally left teaching, um, not wanting to use textbooks and went immediately to a textbook company and became a curriculum designer. <laughs> it was hilarious um actually my teacher friends were like this is the perfect place for you because like you know exactly what to do with the text you know how to make this better yes um, how to make it fun and 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 i think that's the thing that i would want teachers to be able to do is like you know go into like have kids read the book find things that they find interesting and then help them to expand that out even if it's not with stuff that I have written about. Because the fact is, every single day, you know, there are um, archaeological digs, and there are more research papers, and there's more information coming out, like Meroitic script has still not been deciphered. So the whole story of Kandakea Manarenas, for example, is written down someplace, like the whole story, like, you know, in their own words is written down, people have it, it exists but nobody knows how to decode it, right? There was no Rosetta Stone for Meroitic script. So that information is still to be discovered. And I'm really hoping that, you know, when educators share this book with kids, that they let them know that there's still so many more things to find and then help them to, you know, start inside the book, find something that they're really interested in and then give them the tools to go nuts with that and see, you know, what else is there to find? Like, where are the where is the rest of this information? Because, like, I mean, this book is quite slender. Yeah. You know, four years of research and it's quite slender because there was still a lot of missing information. And so that's really the, the, like my big hub is that educators will use it to get kids excited about what's here inside this book. But then they'll be like, all right, run off and go nuts and do your research because there's still plenty more to find. Um, I mean, it would, it would delight me if there were kids who read this and then wanted, like grew up and were like, I'm gonna do the research and I'm gonna find more information. And then there were like 20 more books like this. Like it would delight me. <laughs> you heard it, everyone. You have your mission. Get, go forth um, and <laughs> do your research. Um, I, you just talked about that so wonderfully that I don't know how to make such a weird transition to <laughs> giving you the questions that I told you that I <laughs> just just read away. Just read away. Is that um. I mean, this is amazing. This has been amazing to talk to you about this book. Um, as I was pretty much aware, uh, we were gonna go over time um, because I just can't stop talking to you. And so thanks everyone who is still watching with us. Um, 
with that being said, we want to ask you some personal questions about how you feel about your fall season. Because who doesn't want to get to know you more as a human outside of your book? Because you are more than just an author. That's how we'll try to pivot this and turn it, turn it, up, turn it that way. Um, because we just have to get some of these fun questions in before we end our evening together. So, okay. This is the only rules of the game are that if you turn down one of the two options, you are allowed to say neither, but you need to support that with a backup answer. Okay. <laughs> so it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. Okay. Um, and the first question is pumpkin spice lattes or mulled wine? Mulled wine. See, this is what has been so interesting. This is really a 50-50 split down, down the seams. Even a Parisian the other day was like, yeah, I choose pumpkin spice latte over mulled wine. And like, people were like, are you even a Parisian then? If it, like, if that, if that's your choice, like, I don't know. Um, so that's fair. Uh, <laughs> it also led to a great conversation. Um, who was this last week? I believe Rachel Harrison, who wrote this incredible book called Cackle, was talking about how by the end of your pumpkin spice latte drink, like what's left at the end is like, so gross, but you just like keep on going for it. You just keep on getting it. So all of that to say, I think mulled wine is a great choice. Well, <laughs> I, I actually choose mulled wine because I don't drink coffee. So that's why. So do you even like mulled wine that much or do you just don't like coffee? I do. I do like mulled okay. wine, but I, but I also I don't drink coffee. So it was an easy choice. Yeah, you weren't torn. You're you're not drinking your pumpkin spice lattes in the mid of August like the rest of us losers are. And I respect you for that. I respect you for that. I'm in the loser category, to be clear, everyone that I just called a loser. Um, I'm with you deeply. <laughs> um, okay, other question. Bobbing for apples or pumpkin carving? Pumpkin carving. I am not getting my hair wet. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Again, can you also imagine, but in the times before COVID, we thought bobbing for apples was a good idea. Yikes. I know. Yeah, that was something that I never did because, I mean, yeah, gross. You know but like also, but like, also, like, when my hair gets wet, like, it's just like, pfft. So, no, that's it's not. It's, like, that. never worth it. You're like, I can go get an apple somewhere else. I don't need to fish for my own apple and then also have to figure out my hair. Yeah, I just was like, who wants to stick their face in water? On a random, at least mostly where I've lived, it's like a random cold October evening. Like that doesn't sound like a good time. No. Um, okay, Frankenstein or Dracula? Dracula. I mean, <gasps> come on. You know, I want to suck your blood. Like, come on. <laughs> Just... <laughs> You're like, that's, that's like that's the right answer. That's <laughs> clearly. Come on. Um, Dracula. Come on. <laughs> I mean, so Frankenstein's a lot of fun. Frankenstein's a lot of fun. I feel like Frankenstein's probably more like funnier to hang out with than Dracula. Yeah, a sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, yeah. But and Dracula's like super serious bookish, you know, but we'll kill you. Um. <laughs> That's amazing because as you're saying that, we'll kill you, Patricia's saying, Drac seems like he'd be more romantic. And it's like, maybe, but then he might kill you. Like, and then kill you. Exactly. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't see that as so romantic. <laughs> I can totally see Drac as being super bookish. And I could also see him like not appreciating. I think you might accidentally, I think I would accidentally laugh at something that Dracula says because he doesn't realize like he's being unironic and right. he's trying to be funny. Exactly. Like Frankenstein's going in for a sense of humor. Dracula's not, but you still find him funny. I, I think they're both a good hang. I think at the end of the day, they're both a good hang. Yeah, probably. Probably they don't like each other too much. Like I don't know that they I like. Don't, I don't see that happening. I feel like there are like different class. You know, there's different class levels there, and I feel like I feel like Dracula is gonna be a snob. To be honest, I think he's a bookish snob that like you want to see his library, but you're like using him for his library maybe too. Like you want to see the cool yeah, like Bell. Like you'd be like Bell, and you're just like I'm just here for your library, dude. You sit over there with your mulled wine. <laughs> Your, your mold wine. <laughs> your blood. You sit over there with your blood and I'm going to be over here. Um. Oh my gosh. Okay. Halloween Town or Hocus Pocus? Oh, that is hard. Oh my God. I love them both so much. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to have to go with Halloween Town. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna have to. A lot of love, and I respect that. I get it. But Halloween Town, 
like we love Debbie. We love Debbie Reynolds. Yeah. We need yeah. Marnie. Marnie's amazing. She does a great job. So, yeah. so I love I, I love that. Um, what was the deciding factor there? Hmm? What was the deciding factor there for you? Um, I feel like I don't know. I feel like with Hocus Pocus, I mean, like I love Hocus Pocus and I watch Hocus Pocus like almost all the time, but I feel like it gets more attention. It does. It and does. I like an underdog. We like a Disney Channel original movie. That's what we. <laughs> That's what we like. We're back for the OG Disney Channel movies. Um, okay, final question. Okay. Um, obviously, very important. Ghosts, real or not? Real. That's, yeah, that's that's 100%. 100% real. I have to say that because I write the Jumpy series. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like, I wasn't going to say anything, but if you said no, I was gonna be like, really? <laughs> Yeah, I have to say that because kids ask me all the time. They're like, oh, are these things real? I'm like, yes, 100%. <laughs> I have to. It's just, you know, I, I feel like at this point I'm contractually obligated. <laughs> you have to say that we believe in them. Um, but I mean, you were pretty quick with an answer, though, too. It felt like a real reaction. And oh, yeah, I, I, I actually do. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like, you know, like sometimes like weird things happen and I'm just like, Clearly a ghost, like clearly. Like, you know, I did not move that thing. It was here and then it was there. I didn't move it, the dog didn't move it. Nobody else is in the house. Ghosts. Someone was like pushing me on this where they were like, well, have you had a ghost experience? And I was like, not one that I can like really like stake my claim in. However, I think that's because they know I couldn't handle it. Like I believe in them. And I think they're like, she can't hang. Like she like she wants to believe in us. She does believe in us, but like we can't show her because she will not be able to sleep for the rest of her life. Oh no, yeah, it's, it's, it'll be over. I remember once I was um, uh, in contention for, I can't remember what, it was like a, a writer in residence kind of situation. And they were like, okay, so we want you to know that the house is haunted. And I was just like, and I'm out. <laughs> I'm good. I, yeah, I was like, it was literally me and one other person. And that was like towards the like the last interview. And they were like, yeah, so the house you would be staying in is haunted. And I'm just like, and we're finished. <laughs> I I truly. Yeah. I That's a real thing that happens. I was just like, no, thank you. That's and great. these are the tidbits that, like, I don't know what question I would ever ask you that would get to that little anecdote, but this is why we do these this or that's at the end, because that is going to live rent free in my head for a while. Like, I'm going to tell people that story. I'm going to tell people about this interview. So um, I do want to add in that Patricia wanted us to know that we wouldn't be able to eat guacamole with Frankenstein. So. Oh, no, but because of the mashing, because of the monster mashing. <laughs> I guess. Or is it because he's green? Why? I don't I have to know why. Patricia, clarify for us. Please. Yeah, um, I need to know what is. Also, if it's mashing, do we just give him an avocado? Like, do we just put everything in there and he just right. and then he can mash, right? Is he a guacamole maker. What? What? Patricia I... says because he's green, he won't eat guacamole. Because he's here. okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I understand it. It could feel like mocking. I get it. It could feel a little rude. Maybe. Uh, it's okay. We can we can skip the guac that night. That's okay. We can have the salsa. Six other days of the week. Yeah. We, <laughs> we can have guacamole the six other days, the night that we're hanging out with Frank. Maybe we don't. That's right. Exactly. Totally fine. We, we you know, we will not make Frank feel uncomfortable. No, we're not about that. Like drinking red wine with Dracula. Patricia, I appreciate your investment in this. <laughs> Listen, it often feels like I'm up here being really invested in this or that questions, and that's fine with me because I love them. But Patricia, you win the award for being the most engaged audience member, especially for the this or that portion of the event. Um, although- We appreciate that. <laughs> although everyone has been watching, you've been amazing. Thank you so much for your comments. We've loved, I am, reading through them and hearing them um, and giving you shout outs. So we really appreciate that. I want to take a second to let everyone know where you can purchase your own copy of African icons. Um, 
<laughs> Yay! Um, and also to say that if you're a St. Louisan, I'm very excited to announce, and you can find more about this on the Noble Neighbor Instagram page, but Tracy is going to be one of our featured authors for our Your Own Profit, which takes authors into underserved schools in St. Louis. And so Tracy's gonna do a school visit for one of our local St. Louis City uh, public schools. And all of the third and fourth graders that attend the visit will be receiving a copy of the book. So if you, um, I mean, that's so amazing. I cannot wait to see how your visit goes. I know that these students are absolutely going to love you. You're so engaging. This has been such a fun conversation. Um, <laughs> So just had to give a shout out to um, to the noble neighbor while we were at it. But um, all that to say, I think sadly our time has come to an end. Look at us, we're on time. I'm usually going over an hour. Uh, we are right at an hour, even though this is supposed to be a 45 minute event. Um, so again, thank you everyone who hung out with us. Thank <laughs> you Tracy for continuing the hangout. Um, this was wonderful. Uh, anything else that you wanna say before we sign off for the night? I would love to say that, um, first of all, thank you for having me. <laughs> this was super fun. <laughs> That's number one. And number two, um, uh, if you really like, um, you know, building crap, <laughs> like go out and get like us. <laughs> like, honestly. Like you think that that's not a thing that'll like help you figure out how to write stuff, but like trying to build something and then breaking it down and like starting over is like a really good way to like figure out how to make a thing and writing is exactly like that. So, and I actually just like figured that out tonight. <laughs> I was like, oh, right. It's kind of really, it's like, yeah, that's like a good way to like do things. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. You heard it kids. <laughs> That's how you learn to be a great writer, being comfortable with breaking stuff down and building it back up. If you love Legos, you can be an author. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's our takeaway. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And um, we actually will be back tomorrow night. So if you want more virtual events, uh, you can also check those out on our website as well. And I'll see some of you maybe tomorrow then. So thank you so much again, Tracy. I hope you have an amazing rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Bye, everyone. Bye.